Say yes to new beginnings. Yes. Say yes to new standards of excellence. Yes. Say yes to engage in reportage with a difference. Yes. Introducing Yes International Magazine. The time to say yes to your dreams and aspirations is here. to another edition of our Instagram live uh, session. My name, like I always say, has not changed. My name remains Azu Arinze. And my guest tonight is uh, Professor O.K. Ndibe. Professor O.K. Ndibe is a respected and renowned uh, novelist columnist and essayist. He was born in Yola, Adamawa State. He hails from Anambra State and he is married from the South West, which makes him a complete uh, Nigerian. He had his primary education in Enugu, Anambra State and his secondary education at St. Michael's Secondary School, Nimo, also in Anambra State. Of course, um, Professor Ndibe <laughs> has been writing uh, for as long as I can remember. His MFA is in writing and his PhD, Literature, the University of Massachusetts, Amherst in the United States of uh, America. His first book or novel <laughs> is uh, was, <laughs> was Arrows of Rain, followed by Foreign Gods Incorporated. Of course, there are also other books like uh, Never Look an American in the Eye. There's also the My Biafran Eyes. Of course, tonight he will be educating us on what it takes to be a good uh, writer, as well as why we must never look an American in the eye. Good evening, Prof, and thanks so much for joining us. Thank you very much, Azo. It's, uh, it's my delight to join you. Thank you very much. Now, my first question is, uh, what got you interested in writing? Oh, it's a long story. Um, uh -huh. I'm going I'm to try and give you the shortened version. I was very fortunate right. growing up. Uh, to have uh, parents who insisted that all of us, all their children, they have five of us, uh, must read uh, every day. And so um, I like to play a lot. I like to go hang out with my friends. But in order to earn the right or the privilege, if you like, to go play with my friends, my mother, uh, who was a school teacher and uh, a headmistress, uh, would insist that I read a book. Um, either a whole book, if it was a small book, or that I read a chunk of a book in order to earn the right, uh, the privilege, the permission to go play with my friends. And so at some point I thought this was hell. Um, but then in uh, instilling in, in me and in my other siblings this um, requirement, this obligation to read, uh, ultimately, my parents gave us um, what I'll call a passion for reading, a passion for literature. Um, so on my own, I then became, and I have been, a lifelong voracious reader, as, as I say. And um, the story of how I turned from a reader to a writer is, is an interesting transition, uh, which is... Uh, um, 
part of what happened uh, when I talk about writer, I mean an author, uh, because I became a journalist in Nigeria. I um, simply, uh, by writing in my last year of secondary school, uh, one day I had the fancy to write an opinion piece for the Daily Star newspaper, which was the big newspaper in the southeastern part of the country at the time. So I wrote something in, in my handwriting, uh, in my long hand, and sent it off. And one day my father uh, called me and said, uh, did you send a piece to the Daily Star? I actually wanted to deny it because I thought that what had happened was perhaps that the newspaper had uh, written to my father and said, tell your son not to send us his puerile or juvenile pieces that he can't write. So I was about to deny it because, you know, of course, growing up, we were cane, right, when we behaved badly. Uh, but my father said to me that a piece had come out in the day's Daily Star and that it had my name. At which point I told my father indeed that I had sent a piece to the Daily Star and I got a hug. So rather than being caned uh, for doing something wrong, I got, a, I got um, an embrace from my father. And so this was very, a very emotional turning point for me to see that writing was good and that I was capable of writing at the level of the newspaper and that uh, it was something that was pleasing to my parents and uh, that I would be rewarded for it. Um, and so I continued uh, to send pieces to different papers. So in the end, I wrote for the Punch, I wrote for uh, the New Nigerian, I wrote uh, several pieces for the, uh, uh, for the um, National Concord, Abiola's paper. Um, I wrote more for, um, uh, for the Daily Star. So, so that when um, I finished my studies, I studied business management at both Yaba College of Technology and IMTA Enugu. Uh, when I finished, I was invited by Ray Abu to be on the editorial board of, uh, of the Concord. I sat with people like uh, Ray Abu himself, um, the late Telegiwa, um, um, uh, Louis Obi, you know, so it was an editorial board of really accomplished writers, and I was honored as a pool, as, as, a, as a youth corps member, to be a member of, uh, to be on that editorial board. And the day I finished my editorial, uh, my youth, youth service, I had four job offers from different newspapers because I had made a name at this point as a writer. So uh, the rest is history. <laughs> what an interesting story. All right, Prof, I would like to find out from you, what was the title of the first story ever that you wrote? Oh, my gosh. Well, so the, the first, um, I guess you're talking about a journalistic piece. Is that what you're saying? Yes. I, uh, okay. Oh. Uh, that is absolutely so. This was the piece I wrote when I was in secondary school, my last year of secondary school. I can't remember. I don't remember uh, the name. Uh, and sadly, uh, the newspaper is defunct. And um, unfortunately, we have uh, a poor history of archiving material uh, so that, that that piece is lost. In fact, I. I was in Enugu some years ago and wanted to know if I could go to the paper and, um, and find that piece because I, I would have wanted to reread the piece that I wrote as a secondary school kid. But instead of, since I can't remember the, the title of the first piece I wrote, I'm going to tell you a story of the first major right. assignment I did as a journalist, as, a, as an official journalist. So, um, so when I finished my youth service at the Concord, I was hired by um, African Concord um, or Concord Weekly, they called it at one point, which was the weekly magazine of the Concord group of papers. And Louis Obi was my editor. Uh, before I started the job, I visited a friend of mine in Ogidi and uh, I was raving to her about Chino Achebe. I said, I wish that I could, I was from Ogidi so that I would say that Chino Achebe uh, was uh, 
intimately related to me in some way. And so this young woman had a wry smile on her face, and she said to me, do you know that Achebe is my uncle? Uh, I thought she was joking. I said, you don't mean it. And he said, he is. And she said, his house is around the corner from our house. And she told me that he happened to be home from uh, UNN and Soka, where Achebe was a professor at the time. And she said, would you want to go meet him? And so she took me to Chino Achebe's home. And Achebe was just wonderful and gracious. I remember he offered me a bottle of Coca-Cola and some biscuits. And, um, and so I told him I had just finished my youth service. I'd been hired by uh, uh, the uh, Concord group um, to work on their magazine and that I'd like to interview him. So he gave me his telephone number at Ansoka and said, whenever you're ready, I'll give you an interview. So I came when I resumed uh, my, uh, at, the, at the Concord as a full-time journalist now. I told Louis Obi that I had met Chino Achebe and that he had agreed to give me an interview whenever I wanted. So Louis said, that's going to be your first assignment. So I was sent <laughs> uh, to, uh, to Enugu, you know, to spend about a week, go to Nsuka and interview Chino Achebe. And so Achebe and I met at his office at the Institute of, Af of African Studies at UNN. And for almost three hours, I asked him questions. And... Um, I returned to Enugu, uh, where I was staying at Hotel Presidential. Some of my friends in Enugu came to my hotel room, and they wanted to hear Achebe's voice. And so I thought I'd take the call, since I was the one who had that voice, right? And so I pressed play, and there was silence. I um, put in another tape. I press play, there was silence. So I had interviewed Achebe for close to three hours, but got nothing. The tape recorder had malfunctioned. Wow. And so I had to call Achebe in panic. And when I got him, I said, please, I'm sorry I wasted your time. Just give me 25 minutes. Let me return tomorrow and do a 25-minute interview. But Achebe was such a generous and gracious man. He said to me, I'm busy tomorrow, but if you can come the day after tomorrow, I'll give you as much time as you wanted. So two days later, I returned to, uh, to do an, a second interview uh, with Achebe, and I went, I borrowed three tape recorders for that encounter. So that's how Chino... <laughs> to Achebe avoid the... Yes, 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 yes. No technical malfunction. Wow. Yes. Wow. Wow, what an interesting story. What an interesting story. I will still come back to Achebe, Achebe, but let me just take my questions sequentially. Now, to write well, bro, what must one do? What I, I tell students, and when I tell any writer, any person who really takes writing seriously, is first of all, be a good reader, okay? Uh, mm. For me, it's actually inconceivable that you could be a good writer if you don't read. And so sometimes when I encounter uh, young people, whether it's in America or in Nigeria, uh, who tell me that they want to be writers, I say, what, what are your favorite books? Or tell me the interesting books you've read in the last six months. And some of them just stare at me. They haven't read. And I say to them, odds are you can't be, uh, you can't distinguish yourself at any rate as a writer unless you read. Because reading, in a lot of ways, is the raw material, right? Um, that you use, part of the raw material. You have to have a good story to tell. So what I tell uh, potential or would be a burden writer is to form the habit of reading, to be passionate about reading. Uh, when you read, you find where the competition is. So you take a measure of the competition and you then know what it should, it must take for you to uh, either meet their standards or indeed to excel uh, and to ex uh, exceed their standards. So that's one. The other thing is to recognize that you can't settle for the first sentence that comes to your head. That writing is an art and it's a craft. That what you do with stories uh, begins at the level, at the granular level of the sentence that when you write a sentence, there's a chiseling that has to happen. 
um, so you chisel the sentence so that it becomes it begins to sing, okay? It it acquires resonance. It becomes poetry, and then you go to the next sentence, and so that this same uh, kind of wrestling with your material uh, is what you do with the entire story. That you have to, uh, and that's part of what you get when you read a lot, right? Is that you get uh, in a very through the process of osmosis almost, you know, through an osmotic process, you sort of imbibe the technology that great writers have used to tell their stories. So these two things are important, uh, to read a lot, and when you write, not to settle for the first mediocre sentence that comes to you, or to settle for the first, perhaps competent, merely competent draft of a story that you're able to do. That a story... Uh, source actually through the process of, of revision. So revision is critical. Those, so those are the wow. two sort of different uh, um, tips that I give to Baden writers. Wow. Interesting. Now, Paul, to have a taste of success yes. as a writer, what must one do? It depends on how you define success, okay? So some people um, want to go into writing to make money. So when I encounter such people, I say to them, um, find a trade, leave writing, because writing is not guaranteed at all to make you money, <laughs> you understand? So, so money is the thing. <laughs> find something to buy quickly, you know? Yeah. Um, um, but if, for me, for me, to be a writer is, is, is a passionate vocation, right? It is for you to say that the world, the Republic of Letters, is impoverished and will remain impoverished unless and until it receives your own offering, that you are adding to this uh, great harvest of stories of writing out there. So you have to believe that your story is essential, okay? Um, and so when you write at your best level, okay, uh, then you become successful as far as I'm concerned, right? So money is not it. Prizes are not it. Um, much as some writers are very fortunate and make a lot of money from writing, and some writers are very fortunate and get a lot of prizes, but if you look at literature itself, there are writers who got prizes who became forgettable. Writers who got a lot of money at one point and nobody would want to read them uh, one or two years down the line because their writing uh, perhaps served puff. That was the flavor of the moment. So a lot of people went for it. But once there's that satiation, uh, people just moved on because, you know, this becomes tasteless, if you like. Um, but there are writers who come to fame years after their own death, right? Um, there are writers who are discovered um, uh, many years after they've written, they've written a work of genius. One of the stories I tell my students is, to illustrate this point, is of a novel uh, called A Confederacy of Dances, A Confederacy of Dances. It's a novel written by an American uh, writer from uh, Louisiana, uh, uh, Kennedy, John Kennedy Toole was his name. He finished this novel. He sent it out to 20-something publishers, and all of them reje rejected the manuscript. He was wrestling with other kinds of demons in his life, and he committed suicide. His mother was cleaning out his room and saw this manuscript that his son had written. And she sat down and read it. And the woman was so impressed by the power of what her son had written that she began to importune the great American writer then, Walker Percy. And she wanted him to read this book by her son. So he was trying to sort of send her away, you know. But she kept bothering him. So finally he said, okay, I'm going to read this book, this manuscript. 
But the first moment when it bores me, I'm going to throw it away and I don't want you to come harass me anymore. So she agreed. This guy read the manuscript and was blown away by its power. And he then sent it to his uh, publishers who published it. And it became the first novel in America's history to win the Pulitzer Prize posthumously. So I tell writers, this is a book, this is a manuscript that 20 plus professional I'm readers rejected. rejected. It took a lay person, a lay reader, his mother, <laughs> to recognize the wow. of it. Do you understand? So when people say success, there are great novels which are rejected every day. Do you understand? There are mediocre novels and poetry and drama published every day. Okay? In the end, uh, longevity, uh, the l longevity of a work, the way that it speaks to uh, readers across different epochs uh, will determine its relevance and its staying power. And so, uh, so when we talk about success, that's the way that I look at success. Would, is your work going to endure? And is, is it going to speak to people beyond the present age of his composition? Wow. Interesting. Interesting. Prof, what, what is the commonest mistake that most writers make? Well, um, I, I think that the commonest mistake a lot of writers make is, and especially new inexperienced writers, is to think that it's easy. Um, a few years ago, there was, a, a, you know, some debate by some misguided Nigerians who were saying that Chino Atipe <laughs> was not a good writer because, you know, they read Things Fall Apart and, they, you know, the opening uh, the, the language, right? I mean, Things Fall Apart begins... Okonkwo was well known throughout the nine villages and even beyond. His fame rested on solid personal achievements. As a young man of 18, he had brought honor to his village by throwing Amalinza the cat. Amalinza was a great wrestler who for seven years was unbeaten from Omorphia to Mbaina. He was called the cat because his back would never touch the earth. It was this man that Okonkwo, it was this man that Okonkwo um, threw in a fight with the old men agreed was one of the fiercest since the founder of their town engaged the spirit of the wild for seven days and seven nights. So this is the most lyrical, but also assess accessible writing. I agree with you. But people who do not understand writing dismiss it. So, uh, and, and I tell people, right? Uh, so, so I would say technically that the, the, the biggest mistake that some writers make is to think that if it, is, if it looks um, organic, the writing is organic, it reads the way people talk, that it, it's accessible uh, on the first surface level, then that is poor writing. And so there is this attempt by some people to become pretentious and to be inorganic and to be uh, to obfuscate in their writing and they think that that is profundity um, and, and I think that uh, that's a big mistake that a lot of writers make and the other mistake mm. is to settle to settle for the first sentence that comes to them or for the first draft that comes their way Interesting. Interesting. Now, what are the necessary uh, ingredients needed to cook a good story? Hmm. You need... Um, I think that the story has to have delectation. Okay? Uh, the first thing that you have to recognize as a writer is that um, your job is not to feed... Um, Dogon Yaro to readers, okay? That you have to enchant readers. So I said that literature is an art of enchantment, right? Uh, you have yeah. to seduce your readers. And the way you seduce your readers is with just beautiful language and a beautiful voice, right? Um, so all of us 
have great stories in, in us, right? But there are friends, there are particular friends that we have who, when they say, you don't believe what happened yesterday, everybody shuts up because you know this person is a great storyteller. So, and it could be that several, 10 of you saw the same event, but everybody says, you tell the, the story because this person is a great storyteller. So the, the shaping of a story is important. The aesthetic, the, the aesthetic um, uh, um, ingredient is essential. So once you get that down, okay, once you understand that even when you're telling a reader a tragic story, that you tell the story in a way that makes the reader want to listen to it. It's not like, you know, it, it's not like sort of the WhatsApp um, uh, culture that we have where you, you, you get sent videos of beheaded people and so on and so forth. You know, that, that when, you, when, when you're telling a story, even when there's tragedy in the story, it's still a human and complex story. It's not all tragedy. There's humor there. There, there are lessons there so that it's not just the darkness that you are mired in the darkness. So once you get those aesthetic uh, aspects of the story down, I think that ultimately a story falls or stands on the strength of its, um, what I'll call is gravitas. It has to have uh, a certain heft to it. It has to be something that provokes thinking, okay? Um, I personally, I'm not interested in puff. I'm not interested in candy, okay? I want a little bit of bitter, you know? I like uh, uh, bitter cola a little bit because, you know, it has a complex taste. It has it's sort of like red wine, right? So it distills uh, different complex notes in your, in your tongue and in your sensibility when you read uh, a well done story. Wow, wow, interesting. Now, what, what excites you most you know, about being a writer? What excites me is, 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 is the ability um, which musicians do best, right? But the ability to touch another soul. Uh, you know, uh, I, in a lot of ways, as an artist, I'm envious of musicians, okay? Uh, the art form that I would have most found, that I would have found most congenial uh, is, is music. Uh, because you could be in any culture. You could go to China, okay? And you don't speak a word of Chinese. Or you could go to Germany and you don't speak any German. And then they put on good music. And you can't help, you know, you start either um, shaking your head or, you know, uh, stamping your feet or, you know, swaying your shoulders and so on and so forth. So that ability, a writer also has it. But a writer has it in a different way. A writer makes you enter into his universe, the universe, imaginative universe is created, which is a universe where there are moral contestations happening, Right. And what the reader makes, what the reader does is to make you, the reader, invested in this moral drama that he's staging. Okay, and so if at the end of a of a story, or at the end of reading a novel, or at the end of reading a memoir piece, somebody feels enlarged by the piece, feels that I have been spoken to, that this writer has written to me, almost that the writer has sent me a love letter. That's the most beautiful thing that uh, that I get as a writer, and especially when you hear right. from readers who have read your work, and they say, "Whoa, you know, um, it took my breath away." That's beautiful. All right. So, what, what don't you like about being a writer? Ooh, what I don't like is that. Um, first of all, I like everything about being a writer. I'll, I'll do it again if I had a million lives to live. Maybe if I have a million <laughs> and one lives to live, then I'll, at the million and one, one time, I might change and become, um, uh, what would I, a, a palm wine tapa or something. Uh, but 
what I don't like about writing, um, so to say, is that once your book is published, there's a sudden finality to that. You know, so you've made a complete statement and it's final. You sent it out to the world. Um, I'm a perfectionist, which is why I find it difficult to read my own books. Because when I start reading my own books, I say, I should have, you know, rewritten this sentence. I should have used a different kind of metaphor. I should have used uh, a different word here. I should have cut this word and so on and so forth. So I'm, I'm very punishing of myself. You know, even when I write my columns, um, is that sometimes if I reread my column, I rewrite the entire thing because I'm not happy with the way it come out. And even when I'm happy with a piece of work, I sleep over it and I wake up in the morning and I feel, oh, this is terrible. And then I start all over. And so that's why it typically takes me a long time to finish a work because when I sit down to do new writing, I read what I've written yesterday and I end up just rewriting the whole thing and then I'm happy until oh, tomorrow practice. I read it again and you know so my writing process is extremely extremely slow and and so when I encounter writers I mean there are writers who have great momentum right um, the late Nadine Gardema was one she will write a novel in a few weeks uh, but she also told the story that she let the story gestate in her mind so that she's thinking about everything that the characters do and the plot and so on, even what characters say to one another. So when she sits down to write it, she's thought about it for several years. And so it's almost a process of transcribing what's already complete in her brain, right? And there are writers who have written, you know, Nurdin Farah wrote what I consider his best work from a crooked rib. He wrote it in a month, you know? It takes me typically four to five years to finish a novel, you know, wow. and uh, yeah, so I don't have that that fortune. That's a lot, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a lot. Uh, wow, interesting. 